Okay, welcome everyone. Um, actually, we have a number of, uh, more than one, out-of-town uh, visitors today um, visiting us, uh, taking part in the conference. Um, although this is, um, you know, I'm doing this experiment, although actually I didn't get IRB approval, and you guys are the research sub subjects to um, look at the attendance at the conference with a, a certain intervention that took place about two months ago. No more pizza. It's a little nervous. Uh, it would be nice to see, um, see more, uh, more people here. On the other hand, it's the end of the term. It's, it's sunny out, although we have a great speaker. Um, and I think everyone uh, uh, across the program will uh, find his talk interesting because it's, it's very much a blend of, of bio and clinical. So um, some of you know uh, Dr. Reed Thompson who um, is a faculty member here at OHSU. Um, he's a, uh, a physician, actually MD, PhD, um, and uh, his uh, uh, medical specialty is radiation oncology, and he informs me that he just learned that he passed his boards. Um, <laughs> as, uh, um, and the boards for uh, radiation oncology are a lot harder, not only than internal medicine, um, which some of us, David and myself and maybe others in here took, but, but also clinical informatics. And th those are just single tests, but he had to go through this oral exam and so forth. But anyways, he's, uh, he's board certified now. Um, he um, uh, is originally uh, from New Jersey. He um, uh, went to Dartmouth College where he majored in genetics and biophysical chemistry. Um, he then uh, pursued his MD-PhD studies at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York and um, uh, did his uh, dissertation on epigenomic dysregulation associated with intrauterine growth restriction and normal aging. Completed that in 2011 um, and then went on to do um, a medical internship and a re residency in radiation oncology at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he was then um, the uh, candidate who was recruited for a position that was created at the Portland VA, um, the aiming to leverage the Million Veteran Project, um, which is um, um, another one of these kind of establish a million patient cohort uh, projects and, and collect all their data. Um, this one obviously having to do with veterans. And um, so he has a faculty appointment, uh, primary appointment in uh, radiation oncology. Um, he's also involved with the computational biology program, uh, Adam Margolin's program, and also uh, um, a member of the Knight Cancer Institute. So he's going to speak to us today on informatics and radiation oncology and the Million Veteran Program. Take it away. Yeah. So th thanks, Bill. Um, I assume everyone can hear me, I mean, in this room, but presumably uh, listening uh, remotely as well. Um, I'm going to try to keep this broad and really hopefully most relevant and interesting to a, a kind of a, a broad informatics and kind of more clinical informatics expertise. Um, I hope I'm not dumbing anything down. If you want me to fast forward through anything, please feel free to be like, okay, move it along, Reed. But uh, fundamentally, feel free to stop me along as well if you guys have any questions and want to dive into anything further. Um, I won't be, be um, discussing too much about my ongoing work right now and some of the genomics um, products I, I, I'm pursuing, but I, I, I I, I wanted to keep this kind of broad view and focus on two areas, the radiation oncology in general, and then the Million Veterans Program, which, which Bill um, just mentioned. Um, so I have nothing to disclose. Um, and this is the, the quick outline for, for my talk today. Actually, you know, I'm clicking here. I should use this guy. Um, uh, so first off, I just want to touch upon what is radiation oncology. Frankly, I, I'm embarrassed to confess that I think a lot of other doctors, you know, board certified in whatever their specialty is, don't know what radiation oncology is. So, I'll give a quick primer and go into some of the more informatics components um, therein. We're not going to belabor this at all, but when we talk about radiation oncology, we're thinking about x-rays and gamma rays, which are on the far uh, end of the wavelengths in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum. And these, actually, we can use interventionally. Um, the reason why we use these interventionally is because when you actually have an x-ray, you can direct it towards a target, um, and um, you could actually um, elicit um, uh, DNA damage um, directly from the x-ray itself, breakage, other kinds of uh, changes to the DNA. And you could also have indirect action of the x-rays where you can go towards a target, but 
it actually elicits uh, radicalization of the, the, the water molecules throughout the, the cell, and then those themselves can actually um, uh, damage the DNA. So one way or another, radiation can cause DNA damage, and that thereafter causes localized cell death. Um, uh, oxygen itself is a radio sensitizer. It can actually fix that DNA damage as well. So you may not completely kill a cell, but you can certainly damage it irreparably. And then at some later point, um, that, that cell may, may then um, die, unable to divide. I'm not going to go into too much else about the radiobiology. Um, in terms of radiotherapy, broad categories, well, we can deliver radiation from multiple different ways. One broad category, we think about it, external beam from the outside going in. And then the second category here, this brachytherapy, that's basically from the inside out, where you have a radioactive source implanted or, or instilled, and um, that then releases radiation from inside the body versus external beam, where you have this big kind of machine over here where you could actually deliver the radiation um, kind of like a flashlight, um, a very fancy flashlight. There's different types of radiotherapy that could be used, electrons, photons, and various particle therapy. Uh, and I'm not going to go into the physics of any of these either, but fundamentally they have different properties that allow us to deliver the dose to areas uh, of interest in different ways, such that we can spare the normal tissues while still targeting the tumor. I can go into more of this in a second. Um, so in terms of, again, broad thinking about radiation oncology, well, we, we, we touch the lives of over half of all cancer patients. It's a very important modality in cancer care, the other ones, of course, being surgery, chemotherapy, and some other um, types of interventions. Um, uh, again, we, we touch upon um, cancer patients' lives at all aspects of the cancer care. Neoadjuvantly, meaning before other interventions, before surgery, et cetera. Um, adjuvantly, meaning after some sort of surgery or some other intervention. Definitively, meaning we just go radiation alone or radiation with chemotherapy. And then palliatively, meaning that, you know, well, we're not intending to cure anything here, but we can still help with pain and other symptoms. Um, and again, all ages. So cancers from young to old. Uh, and um, occasionally, we're talking about multiple courses. Now, whether that's because one person develops multiple cancers or because Maybe a cancer comes back, you need to retreat, or because there's some staged process to things. Um, and we even treat benign disorders as well. That includes keloids, you know, kind of like a, a, a hypertrophic scar that often happens in the ear, but in other places of the body, and multiple other benign disorders that can be helped with radiation. Uh, and there are relatively few contraindications to radiation alone, but there are certainly a list. One of them is certainly pregnancy. We don't want to radiate um, for a pregnant woman if we could avoid it. Scleroderma is a, an autoimmune disorder that um, uh, basically makes radiation complications much more severe, so it, it's kind of like one of those rock and hard place situations. Um, in terms of then uh, what we actually do, um, and again, sorry for the primer, but I hope that it, it'll, it'll help to understand kind of what comes forward. Um, uh, it involves mobilization such that we can essentially treat a patient the same way each day, right? So this is a multiple treatment regimen that may happen over multiple weeks, Every day, the radiation needs to be targeted specifically to the same spot, and we need to make sure that every day it aligns similarly. Um, and so we also then, so here's a mobilization. It's a picture of like a mask. Here's a whole um, vacuum apparatus that can be used to mobilize someone. Um, there's multiple other different um, varieties of all of this. Um, and of course, we do tumor delineation via imaging. It's a very imaging-heavy uh, specialty. We use CT, MRI, PET scans. Um, and we actually use tattoos and various markers to help us kind of align via lasers where on the body surface we're looking at. Um, so essentially, we take scans with a mobilized patient, and then we do planning on top of those scans such that then we can implement the plan each day for a treatment. Um, briefly, um, we want to delineate the, uh, the target volume, what we call the GTV or the gross tumor volume. Um, it's basically what do you see, what's still left there behind if it's after surgery, is there any residual disease? Um, the CTV is essentially the clinical target value, meaning we want to target microscopic disease, anything that potentially is extension from beyond where the tumor was, um, uh, uh, or other areas that we, we fear that it might have spread to that we can't see with imaging. Uh, and then the PTV is basically a planet target, planet planning target volume, which allows us to account for setup uncertainties, right? Maybe we're pretty good about lining things up, but like it's a millimeter or two off, and we have that tolerance, that threshold, um, that we, we incorporate into the volumes themselves such that, you know, if we kind of miss a little bit one day, it's not going to be a problem. Um, to the right here, we're just looking at um, a whole bunch of structures. This is an axial cross-section of a CT. This is actually a sagittal cross-section of CT um, showing different kind of numbered structures here. It's an anatomy quiz. I'm not going to go through quizzing now. Let's um, say, like, here's the brain, here's the brain stem, spinal cord, et cetera. 
And these are, these are structures that are obviously not tumor. These are normal. But we want to be able to protect them um, from, um, from the radiation as well. Um, so then that comes to the treatment planning. We basically make sure that we delineate what are the structures we want to protect, the various normal organs. And then we also want to make sure that we're focusing on the areas of disease, the GTV, CTV, and PTV that I mentioned just before. Um, after you've actually segmented everything out in an image, uh, and this is done often manually, um, uh, then you want to make sure that you, you do the planning appropriately, which involves some complex um, cost calculations in terms of optimization. Uh, and uh, you know, depends on the modality, et cetera. So you can have all those different modalities I discussed before. And we think about how one may benefit for the other in terms of dosimetric deposition to allow us to target the tumor while sparing the normal organs. Um, and there's varying levels of complexity. It could take quite a long time to do these plans. And it's like revision. It's iterative. Um, uh, and often, as I said, it, it involves multiple plan comparisons. It can certainly involve multiple uh, patient-specific devices, meaning that we might need to build things that allow us to deliver the dose in such a fashion for a patient. Um, and again, it's very customized in that sense. And even during a patient's treatment, we may, need to, we may find that maybe the tumor has shrunk significantly, and we want to actually replan. So there's this adaptive process that may be required during a treatment. Um, OK, and then finally, in terms of you know, the broad kind of radiation thought, is just about side effects. And what is the effect of radiation? Well, certainly, the easy one to think about is, well, let's kill tumors and let's get rid of them. OK, that's, that's a given. But it has, there, there's a cost to that, and it's a side effect cost based on where the radiation goes to normal tissues. Now, um, there's early side effects that could happen during treatment, days, weeks afterwards. And there's actually late side effects. Radiation is often the gift that keeps on giving. And so we see, in terms of our patient experiences, that you know, decades later, they may have any side effects from the radiation. Um, there's deterministic, which means dose-dependent fashion in terms of the side effects, and sometimes stochastic, where there's no threshold. A stochastic side effect is actually like a secondary malignancy, where you can have just a whiff of radiation and cause a secondary malignancy, another tumor. It's not really a dose threshold. Um, anatomic variability, obviously, different amounts of radiation in different parts of the body do different things. Uh, and um, the, these risks are modifiable based on whether or not the patient had concurrent chemotherapy or there's some underlying you know, genetic um, conditions or presuppositions that allow them to be uh, more sensitive to radiation. Um, and then overall, just kind of thought, um, after the patient has done treatment, we really want to carefully monitor how um, these patients um, heal and how they do over time. And this is a very multidisciplinary approach, um, often to prevent these toxicities there's preventative measures, such as like different arm exercises for, for, for mobility that can be done, or lymphedema, some therapeutic massages, and also surveillance, both for recurrence and new primary, and also for watching out for some of these late appearing symptoms. OK, so that's a quick run through of kind of what radiation oncology is, what we do. Now I want to go into some more of the informatics aspects of kind of what radiation oncologists think about. Um, and hopefully this will prove somewhat illuminating. Um, so I'm not going to bore you with what a voxel is. I think everyone here probably knows. But just make sure that we're starting from the exact same place. We very much think about um, individual areas on a scan when we're thinking from radiation oncology perspective. And why? Well, you know, OK, forget about resolution thing. Let me just skip this slide. Um, because a structure is um, composed of individual voxels. And so in here, we're looking at axial cross sections of a CT. This is in the pelvis. And this is actually in a male who we're looking at the level of the prostate here which is outlined in yellow. And in, in a lighter color here, you see the rectum. Um, these, these structures you know, are delineated by hand. Um, uh, and they're composed of individual, individual voxels. Um, and we're basically just creating boundary states to say what's inside versus outside of this structure. Here is a structure. I'm not going to quiz on what it is, but it's kind of an a in to out looking view of the mandible. Um, anyway, that's a 3D reconstruction thereof. But, um, uh, we use all those different voxels to then think about where the dose is going. And so what is a dose grid? Well, a dose grid is essentially a, a, a voxelized image or an, an image that is composed of information about where the dose is going, rather than it being any kind of anatomic information. This rainbow kind of color wash thing is looking at a function of dose. High dose is red, low dose is blue. And we see here throughout this body, it's essentially a similar cross-section to what we were just looking at before in terms of structure. In the pelvis here, we see that there's a really hot spot here going to the prostate. And then there is you know, spared areas around. Um, in order to calculate this so-called dose volume histogram, it's essentially a way of quantitatively assessing where the dose is going to a given structure. You take that segmented structure, and you say, OK, well, what, within that dose grid, what dose is actually going there? And then you can add these up um, based on you know, uh, point and polygon kind of calculations here about what pieces of the dose grid fall within that, that, that delineated polygon. 
Um, you then, um, yeah, I'm gonna skip this. Um, you then basically take the histogram of dose deposited within that structure, and you can do a, a, a differential DVH here. Um, and you could also get this thing called a cumulative DVH, which is actually much more interpretable for a clinician. Uh, and it tells us kind of more about how things are behaving. Um, uh, basically just by, by um, uh, binning um, each of these as an integration. So essentially you add this one to this one, you see here as it stacks up, right? So essentially you have low dose up here, going up to high dose here. And essentially what this says is that volume is on the y-axis, right? So you go to 100% volume by the time you add everything up. Um, and this is looking at dose on the x-axis where the highest doses receive very, very little, or sorry, the, the highest, very, very little of the structure, right? A low volume is receiving the highest doses, whereas pretty much 100% of the structure is receiving zero dose. Hopefully that's kind of intuitive, but essentially, you know, these curves can differ depending upon where the dose is going within a given structure. And when you add all those up on different structures here, plot it again, dose on the x-axis, and volume, this is now relative volume, because considering every structure may be a different size, um, uh, you, you, you see these kind of little spaghetti DVHs. And radiation oncologists are trained to look at these and think about, well, is the dose going where I want it to go? And am I appropriately sparing um, the, the organs that I'm worried about to prevent toxicities? Okay, so we interpret this, and I'm not going to go into details right now. Um, but there are pros and cons of this approach. The pros are that it's quantitative and interpretable, as I mentioned, that you can do toxicity prevention. and use this for plan optimization. In fact, we use it iteratively for plan optimization. Um, but there are significant cons to this approach as well. One is that it's only a single snapshot in time and space, right? So you did the plan, you took a picture, and now we're calculating all this stuff based on a picture, but there's a patient who the anatomy may change slightly. They may be moving a little bit. So it, it's not an exact representation. Um, and then the other thing is that it disregards anatomical heterogeneity. Well, what do I mean by that? Um, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So first on the, the kind of robustness um, factor. So rather than now looking at a single line, you can look at a robustness plot of these DVHs, right? So you have this blue curve, this red curve here. These are the targets. These are um, organs that you want to spare. Uh, and ultimately, why, are, why is there more variability here? Well, essentially what's being done is you're doing the, the take the plan. Now, artificially, move the patient a millimeter this way, a millimeter that way, right? You could do this in silico. You move the patient slightly, and then you see how robust is this plan. Do things change significantly now if you're in a different position? Uh, and the answer is, for at least for these organs, yes, they're changing pretty significantly, whereas for our target structure, again, keeping in mind that we built a PTV, right, to account for the motion so that there's robustness, it's pretty darn good. But it, it, you know, it, it, it captures what I was just pointing out, that there is variability and that, you know, you could look at a single line, but really that belies the fact that there may be some, some variability. Uh, and to the point I, I, I uh, mentioned that there can be anatomic variability, well, um, the, maybe this picture isn't the best one to demonstrate, but these are heart doses, all pretty low and all pretty acceptable. But in this case here, the LAD, right, it's the vessel anterior to the heart, is very significant for feeding the coronary blood supply. Um, but radiation there can really stricture the vessel and cause significant coronary artery disease later on. There's significant differences between these plans depending upon kind of where, now this is uh, running through quickly, but here's the heart in, in this black outline and the LED is kind of this gray area. And we're looking at kind of an on fos view of a beam where this box is essentially kind of what we're treating. Um, and you see that the LED is significantly infield here. It's inside the box, kind of right on the edge of the box and it's kind of outside the box here, meaning that this plan here is this dotted line here where the LED is getting significantly less dose than in either of these plans. Um, and so there's significant differences of where that dose is going, right? The heart overall is just a bunch of blood. There's some valves and things, but there are specific structures therein that may be more sensitive. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Um, clinical imaging, obviously radiation oncology is a discipline that requires um, imaging in order to be able to, to make decisions. And so this is just a, a, a quick run through of some of the imaging that we're working with. Um, the CT SIM, the SIM is that planning scan that I was talking about during a bunch of images, but actually during planning, we could actually do sometimes a 4D simulation, meaning that you could actually have the patient breathe and we watch and see how the anatomy changes with breath. That's not only just in the chest, although that's most significant, but that could happen and there's changes in the abdomen even. Um, we also uh, take MRI images, PET images, various other scans and things that you can do in terms of MR spec, et cetera, to be able to visualize um, uh, other aspects of the anatomy that is not just appreciated on a CT scan, and we incorporate those or merge those in with our CT scans. And we also have verification scans, this kind of uh, plot here is just showing over time, 
where we take multiple time points. So every week the patient is getting new scans and we're seeing how things are changing. So there's a lot of imaging generated in radiation oncology and used by radiation oncology. On top of that, there's more structures. So I mentioned structures, these organs that you want to spare. Well, all of these are delineated. So now you have all these scans with all these structures delineated. Here's a 3D reconstruction of those structures themselves. We're seeing a ton of data. This is a treasure trove. Uh, this is uh, maybe a quick side note, but there is certainly um, differences. I mentioned that the, the structures are generated by manual contouring, essentially. People contour differently. Everyone's got a kind of different approach of how to do things. So this is basically asking a, a number of different experts to delineate the same thing, and you see that there's variability there. And this is looking at the esophagus. This is looking at, actually, I don't even know specifically which different pieces these are. But fundamentally, um, they're, they're, you, know, you might get something slightly different from different people, but not to say that there isn't value there. Um, uh, there's a lot of data. Uh, this actually, I, I should generate this plot um, for the data we have at OHSU, but this is something I just took um, after, uh, from the, the, the last couple of years at Penn. They, they were seeing 2,000 in the ration department, seeing 2,000 new starts a year. That meant over about 15 years, based on some of the calculations I was talking about, there was about 30,000 patients. So that's a lot of patients with a lot of imaging data. Okay, um, I'm going to finally touch upon emerging topics in radiation oncology informatics, um, and then we'll move on to the, the Million Veterans Program. Um, so automated segmentation, I mentioned that we're doing this stuff by hand, delineating kind of let's show what the heart is. Some of these things can be done by a computer, and more and more we'll be seeing this. So it's easy to segment out a lung. It's a, it's a I mean, a, a quick thresholding even um, is almost good enough to do that. Um, and you can see here that then a computer could do this pretty quickly. Um, the limitations uh, to be able to do this, at least for this kind of approach, um, are for soft tissues where um, there is a s very slight difference in contrast changes. Um, delaying the bladder, for instance, is much more challenging than delaying the lung via automated techniques. Um, and, and a lot of the techniques these days don't have any regard for anatomy. So, you know, sometimes if you do this delineation, you'll see that then you'll just start flying the bronchi up to the trachea and you see that it ends up going out the body and then you see like the whole lung is the body, right? I mean, I, that, as an example. Um, so we can do a little bit better when we start getting at a structure-specific auto-segmentation. Um, certainly people are talking about it more and more. Um, it is a hot topic, but I, I got to say that there's really no winning uh, solutions right now. Um, uh, so if you can account for the anatomy, the shape, size, location, orientation, the organ-specific contents, so the distribution of Hounsfield units, what the boundary conditions look like, um, then we could probably do a better job, and people are trying this. Um, this gets at a second point from radiation oncology. We use this image to actually deliver dose, and I mentioned these dose grids. Well, if you're taking one scan and you're trying to compare in another scan, so in this case we're looking at a fusion of a, of a planning CT and a rigid PET alignment, right? Maybe the, position, the, the patient was in a slightly different position when they had the PET scan than when they had their CT scan. Um, and what, what happens then is that, you know, maybe they align in certain areas, but a rigid alignment doesn't get everything aligning appropriately, and so that's where what we call deformable registration comes in, right? Can you, can you take the image and modify it so now you're warping the spine so that the head tilt works the same way, et cetera? Um, and yes, we can get much more, uh, much more close um, alignments using deformable registration. Uh, the problem is that it's difficult to assess the, the quality of that deformable registration. Is it artificial or is it actual? Um, uh, and, and it can sometimes require manual guidance. There's, again, no regard for anatomy at all. It's a mathematical process that you apply, or it's a mathematical transform. And the severe caution that I point out here is regarding dose deformation. I'll show this, and you'll, you'll see what I mean in just a second. So here is um, basically looking at um, algorithms, a collection of different algorithms. These are like, what, 12 different algorithms applied to do this deformal registration. Basically, just looking at the image, let's warp one image to become like the other image, and so we're getting A and B aligning. If we then apply the dose grid before and apply that same warp, so now the dose grid is transferred to the new image, um, the problem there is that it's not actually appropriate. And you see here kind of these weird pushes. I, without going too much into kind of details here, what, what this is saying is how much the dose is deformed. And this is, you know, both hot and cold are kind of bad. You want it to kind of be a mill. You don't want the dose itself to be deformed in some weird non-anatomical way, but that's exactly what's happening here. You could push a voxel one way or another, and it matches an image very well, but is that appropriate to then move the dose somewhere completely different? The answer, of course, is no. So this is where it becomes dangerous, right? You get an image to look well, but when you're actually treating a patient and you're saying, I want a sum from my prior plans, and now we're going to plan with this new thing, how do those plans align? You might, be, you might be convincing yourself inappropriately and causing harm to a patient. Um, okay, 
Um, in, in radiation oncology, like many other fields, um, uh, I would say machine learning is definitely coming through more and more. This is just a small example of something that, that I was collaborating on at Penn, looking at radiation pneumonitis. Radiation pneumonitis is a, um, uh, a, a lung toxicity essentially induced by radiation, um, and it's just a machine learning approach to try to predict a poorly predicted phenomenon. You can basically take in dosimetric endpoints, toxicity endpoints, and we're following all these patients, and bring in the various dosimetric variables, right, how much dose is the lung receiving, et cetera, as well as um, various clinical va variables. What ethnicity are they? What age are they? Yada, yada, yada. And try to come up with some better modeling of an explanation for who is going to, or prediction of who is going to get pneumonitis or not, which is, of course, important. Um, and then lastly, there, there, there is radiomics, which kind of is a, putting in quotes here, it's definitely newfangled, but quite important. The idea being that, you know, um, there's molecular information captured within an anatomical scan. Now, our eyes may not always be tuned to detect or trained to detect this, but it's certainly a reflection of the physiology, the metabolism, the protein, and ultimately the genome. Um, and how much you can capture in a given scan is very much a question mark. But we're learning more and more that we actually are able to capture some stuff that we didn't realize we could. Um, basically, imaging reflects biology. That's kind of the hypothesis, but something that we've also found. Uh, and I don't say we meaning me, I mean kind of the field broadly. Um, uh, so a quick example then of radiomics, right? You can basically take a bunch of different lung cancer patients. You can automatically segment out the lesions here. These are now boxed off in green. You then apply um, feature extraction, all sorts of different things you can do. We're not going to go into the details. And then you could ultimately say, okay, now we have this grid of radiomics features for a given patient. And it could be, again, spatially uh, aware. Uh, but you can correlate that with, then with gene expression or various clinical data, survival, other things. Gene expression, meaning are you upregulating some pathway, et cetera. Um, and so here's a, basically a grid where you have patients on one axis. There's a heat map, right? Patients on one axis. And the other is just a whole bunch of radiomics features. This is fair, poorly interpretable in general, but it breaks down to kind of three clusters is what they're finding. Uh, regardless, if they actually um, take some of these radiomics features, and say, let's apply this to a cohort of lung cancer patients and say, how well does this predict survival? Actually, the radiomic, radiomic details alone, just looking at the scan, taking a picture, tells, it actually gives a split, a statistically significant different split in survival um, for lung cancer as well as head and neck cancer, which is kind of crazy. So there's definitely something about capturing biology there. Um, yes? What is an example? Say, sorry, say it again. So a, a pram, a easy parameters are the shape, the size, right, that kind of thing. There's these things which are completely uninterpretable, like wavelets, which is a Fourier transform of an image, right? It's a deconvolution, essentially. And you're saying, you know, can we interpret more that's there? Is there some sort of kind of repetitious pattern, et cetera? There, there, there's hundreds of features that you could apply, and there's dictionaries out there of different radiomics techniques. Um, and who knows what the heck one given thing actually reports on, but it's more than the eye can see. I'll leave it at that. Um, okay, uh, lastly, just to get you guys thinking a little bit, clinical uh, informatics opportunities in radiation oncology, there's certainly plentiful. Um, there's interoperability of uh, various clinical systems, right? We use all sorts of different treatment planning software that's not your kind of standard fare. Certainly it's not EPIC, although we use EPIC routinely and, and, and deeply for all the charting of notes and FOPs and toxicity management. Um, but all of the dosimetric stuff is completely in a different system, and so the talking of one to the other is, is definitely an ongoing challenge. Moreover, um, this is just something even more simple. This is looking at just the DICOM RT, which is basically a, an enhanced um, DICOM object, which allows you to store radiation information as well. We don't even put that data into the PAC system afterwards. So, you know, a patient might have gotten radiation treatment. We have all the plans, but now some other doctor, whether it's in the ER or otherwise, is saying, okay, well, I'm looking at this, and I, I can't actually see the plans. I don't know where the radiation went. All I know is they got radiation. But where the radiation went is something very, very important. And actually, that has a bearing on even determining whether or not a patient has pneumonitis for a radiologist. So these, these kinds of things are actually very clinically relevant. We don't even do that. So there's opportunities for sure there. Um, there's also opportunities actually at the level of the treatment planning systems in terms of scriptability, being able to do automated planning, do some of this kind of stuff that I was talking about in terms of automatic contouring, yada, yada, yada. Um, and image processing, there's certainly, I mean, we didn't touch upon this, but deep learning of various segmentation tasks. Um, can, we, can we define predictors of clinical uh, outcomes, et cetera? Ema is another radiation oncologist, also just passed his boards. Um, uh, uh, so and I, I would just ask, what might you envision? There's a million and one things you could do with this, and a lot of people are doing things. But I, I imagine that 
you don't get much exposure to what we do in radiation oncology. We're often kind of lost in another area, and I, I think it is very relevant what we're doing. We're doing a lot of information. Okay. Um, I'm not going to do the summary here. Um, so the Million Veterans Program, Changing Complete Gears. The reason why I want to touch upon this one is in part because that's why I'm here, um, and here being OHSU and the VA, um, uh, and, and, and more importantly, because this is something that I see really is an opportunity moving forward. Right now, there isn't anything we're doing with it fundamentally, right? It's, it's still something coming down the pipe. But uh, I think it's exciting, and I'm excited to talk with you guys about it. Um, so opportunities at the VA, well, there are many, but um, it's an enormous integrated database, over 8 million veterans, lots of hospitals and clinics, lots of longitudinal data in the EMR, and certainly comprehensive health information, labs, imaging, yada, yada, yada. Um, the Million Veterans Program specifically, right, was designed to, to recruit a million veterans, get their genomic data, and um, uh, monitor them over time, right, as an observational study, um, and capture all their clinical data as well. So it's a massive biorepository, ultimately, is what they're creating, with genome scale genetic data and extensive phenotypic data. I say extensive in quotes, actually. I didn't put that in quotes there. But it, not everyone is going to have extensive data, fundamentally. Um, and the really exciting thing is actually there is recontact potential, meaning that all these people who sign up, actually, if you find some cohort identified from the genomic data, you could actually then go back. This is theoretically for the moment. But you can go back and then contact these people and say, follow up on a survey or follow up on some enrollment for another study. Um, and there's sites all around the country, and we're definitely one of them. And we're actually one of like, the gold star recruiting sites, which is pretty awesome. Um, so the data captured within the MVP is, is fairly extensive. There's this baseline survey. It's like 15 or so, pa or 10 pages, excuse me, the other one's longer. Um, about 70% of the veterans who enroll in MVP actually have completed this baseline survey, which asks a whole bunch of stuff, demographics, you know, age, gender, ethnicity, et cetera, physical features, their height, weight, skin tone, hair, handedness, uniform service exposure, right, so their military branch, their combat uh, history, their station, meaning were they Asia Pacific, where else, right, um, their activities and habits, exercise, drinking, their health status, so wellness, medical history, healthcare utilization, family history, and here's just one, snip, one snapshot of a page from this intake form, and you see various boxes, and they ask some questions, right, you know, does your health now limit you in these activities? If so, how much? Moderate activities such as, and then it goes on through the little check boxes and things. So it's a way of getting structured information about some of these kind of otherwise fuzzy and hard to assess um, patient reported kind of uh, points. And this is at baseline. So clearly you can offer additional services, follow up, et cetera. There's also this lifestyle survey, which about 55% of the cohorts completed. Um, and, and that includes personal information, personal habits. I mean, similar types of things to what are on the baseline. Sort of, these dive into a lot more detail. So for instance here, dietary habits, which is kind of one of those last bullet points. Right? This is looking at for each food listed. I mean, who is complete, complete this and accurately? I don't even know. But, but uh, mark the column indicating how often, uh, on average, you have used the amount specified during the past year. And so here's for dairy foods, skim or low-fat milk. And it's like, two to four ounces per week, yada, yada, yada. So like, it, it really goes like, into that level of crazy detail. And 55% have completed the survey. I cannot tell you. I have not access to the data. I have no idea degree of completeness. And you know, when you start dealing with completeness, then you also deal with like, uh, bias and missingness. And is that a random? But you know, the, that's a whole other can of worms. Fundamentally, there's a lot of potential to really capture some deep data there for lots of people. Uh, this got rotated. This is a, a, a flub from going from Mac to PC, excuse me. But basically, um, this is, uh, I'm not in, 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 intend for you to read upside down. Uh, basically, this is describing the, the data set for the, the array itself. So about, uh, the large majority of patients are going for a genotyping array rather than um, actual uh, exome sequencing or, or, or even whole genome sequencing. But there, there are both of those happening with the cohort as well. To make it cost uh, effective, they're, they're, most of the, the patients are actually or most of the veterans are actually um, getting this, this kind of custom axiom array. And this is basically just describing some of the things that are, that are on there. There were a lot of VA-specific things they wanted to enhance. So for instance, like this psych chip thing, which basically is like a, a, a way of as assessing genetic predictors of, of psychiatric stuff. There's this, uh, PTSDs and stuff in there. They, they wanted to enhance the African-American kind of normal variant cohort. They wanted to add other quote unquote clinically significant markers. And if you look at the clinically significant stuff, it's for a lot of diseases and things that are very relevant to the veteran population. Um, but they, they, they actually have a, a pretty good cohort of interesting genes. The, the problem with this is, of course, you know, you may have 
you're just looking for a single SNP for a gene, you may miss kind of a, a lower variant in the same gene, and you're never going to be able to detect that. So this is, this is one of those um, what's under the lamppost kind of searches. The whole exome and whole genome data is very much looking more broadly at what's outside of the light, right? Which is, which is often where there's interesting biology as well. But most of the data is confined here. Um, this is actually a very quick early snapshot from when they've still had like only 70,000. Now they're well over 400,000 uh, patients enrolled. Um, but but um, basically, this whole plot is just showing that there's fairly good representation of the, the MVP enrollees from both the, the current MVP sites, right, those who could potentially enroll, as well as the VA database overall. So it's relatively good representation. One kind of aberrancy you have here is age 60 to 69 patients where, where a higher proportion of MVP enrollees. Um, I have no idea why this is or ha if, w if that continued to pan out, but it's something that certainly uh, they're watching. And very importantly, they want to make sure to try to boost the actual female cohort. So I think over time we're probably going to see this um, uh, plot jump up a little bit. You have a question. Uh, it, it is. It is. Uh, so I'll, I'll actually get to that on, oh, not this next slide. I'll get to that in a slide or two. But, but, um, but you're absolutely right. It's actually boxed off separately at the moment, right? It's a whole separate application process. Like I, I sit here standing before you speaking about the MVP, literally not having seen a single shred of the actual data beyond just some of the summary statistics and stuff, right? The only way you get access to this data is ultimately to have one of these like pilot projects, which they're, they're starting to go through right now. So before I even came here, pilot project 2015, they have a first round, like an alpha study, basically saying, here, dive into this data. We offer no promises about how you're going to be able to navigate, et cetera, but let's see what you do with it. And they took four, four specific uh, products that we're looking at. One is on cardiovascular risk, looking at obesity, lipid levels, kidney disease, multi-substance use, and metabolic syndrome. These are all very common kinds of things that happen, certainly in the veteran cohort. There's obviously some overlap there with the metabolic syndrome and the cardiovascular risk and even the kidney disease a little bit, right, because that's related to hypertension, et cetera. So it's not that these are even completely separate studies, but they said, here, a bunch of teams, this is interesting, this is exciting, let's see what you can do. I, I don't know that there's anything to report from any of these at this point, but um, these are certainly ongoing. And then they actually, in 2016, um, uh, had another pilot round, um, and this was diversifying a little bit more, looking at Gulf War illness, PTSD, schizophrenia and bipolar and macular degeneration. I feel like they're like themes, like this is like metabolic, et cetera, and, and maybe some multi-substance use, and this is more like a, a, a psychiatric NO, NOS or something. But um, they, they definitely um, are starting to branch out and actually just released a gamma round, um, uh, which, which is, you know, we have our fingers crossed that maybe there'll be things like cancer and other diseases that pop up in, in that, because there's a lot of other things that we could be asking this cohort and exploring, but it's still not completely prime time. More to Christian's thing about the, 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 um, the mechanism of storage, et cetera, there's this whole environment that they've created to be able to kind of not only do the intake, but also do some of the processing. And so this is uh, this thing called Genesis, which is a whole separate system to do the recruit and enroll. This is a form from basically the recruit and enroll procedure. So a, 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 an enrolling site can basically say, okay, well, I have this patient sitting in front of me. They, they ate, you know, seven hours ago, and here's a blood tube, it prints a barcode, they draw on, and they send it off. That's basically it. There's more to it, but that, that's, that's the large bulk of that part. And then there's this whole other system here, which things feed into, uh, essentially, for the scientific environment. The idea being that the MVP data will be able to talk to the CDW, uh, which is the clinical data warehouse, and, 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 and be able to merge these in um, once you have access to the MVP data. Um, so there will be that ability to talk. But otherwise, um, you, can't, you, can't op you, can't, you can't access the MVP data from the CDW. Uh, and they, they basically created a whole remote analysis environment to do this. Um, there's software that you can use on there, R, SAS, yada, yada, yada. And it's customizable. You put other things on there as well. Um, they have a bunch of uh, SANA scratch space. And it, they, they actually have provided a 192-node cluster um, to be able to do some of the compute. And actually uh, have a partnership with DOE to really kind of ramp up as, as things get going. Um, and there's third-party knowledge-based integration as well. So right, can you port in uh, data from uh, the NCBI, various other databases, 1,000 genomes, et cetera? Um, this is a little bit more just kind of about the complexities of, of, of VA CEW structure. I, it, this is just a, a cartoon kind of showing what is certainly a complex system. I, I, I actually cannot claim to completely understand the way they've structured everything. But it, it is complex, and it's, it's definitely divided into regions. So there, there's, 
different layers of the actual CUW in terms of accessibility, but ultimately one of the ports to actually be able to ask research-related questions of is through this thing called Vinci, which is through Salt Lake, which ultimately is kind of a, a research core to be able to patch into the CDW, and they're there to not only support, but also to, to um, uh, perform some of these analyses. So a lot of the, the um, MVP kind of products to date are in partnership with Vinci. Um, so I don't need to lecture you guys about data ontologies, but obviously these are important. Uh, a lot of the data from the CDW, et cetera, is not kind of rich in terms of all of these um, already structured um, uh, uh, pieces, and there's, there's obviously a lot that needs to be uh, derived in terms of NLP from notes and things that you could potentially get out as well. A lot of the initial projects are not diving into that level of complexity. It's much more easily phenotyped kind of um, uh, 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 topics and questions. Um, and this is just a point about kind of phenotypic accuracy. Obviously, this is the bane of a lot of people's existence dealing with clinical information. It, it's messy, it's noisy, yada, yada, yada. There's missingness. And so ultimately, can you get um, really who are the true cases and who are you missing, et cetera? This is one of the main questions that actually is now through these pilot rounds in the VA is how can you really get those good rich phenotypes out? And then once you have those, then you can merge in with the, the genetic data. But it, there's, there's a mess in the first place. Um, and this is just an easy point, but we know that sequencing data is increasing. And beyond the MVP, you know, just more and more sequencing data, as our capacity to store and generate increases, we really are starting to hit those hurdles of doing analysis. And I know that, right, I, I know that it's a very common denominator for a lot of people in terms of challenges. And so um, I'm not going to go into these details here. This is basically just looking at possible uses of the MVP. This is, you know, at a very, very basic level um, and, and not even applying it to a specific disease. But pharmacogenomics, very much relevant. To actually, within the Axiom panel, they've really focused on a number of pharmaco pharmacogenomically relevant, or at least that we know of, relevant um, uh, polymorphisms, which may influence you know, levels of a drug, et cetera. So pharmacogenomics is a big deal. Um, and we can certainly talk about that at some length. Um, there is, there's a whole bunch of GWAS studies that have been performed. Some of them, I think, are complete, um, um, well, I won't, I won't use a swear word, but not good. And um, an example, I, I'm, not, I'm not even particularly pointing out this, just but the genomics of white wine preference just to me strikes as very funny. Like on its head, I don't even understand that. So there's a lot more genomics studies that are, that are um, increasing. And I think, it, it, caveat emptor, but it's very important to do these analysis rigorously. Uh, and I think it's going to be a challenge. I'd ask you kind of what questions might you think about asking of the MVP? Um, and what kind of information would we mine uh, in terms of phenotyping appropriately to be able to generate the kind of endpoints about gene genetic predictors? Um, that's really it. We've, we've touched upon kind of two broad categories, race oncology and the MVP. Um, I really did not dive into specifics for either in, in too much detail, but I, I'm happy to discuss. And I'd ask if you guys have questions, and I'll take it from there. Question and, and let me ask uh, for those who don't normally attend our conference: if, if you ask a question, to push the button on the microphone so the people listening on the webcast can hear the question. Um, I, I apologize if you mentioned this, but um, is the um, when researchers work with the data, is it de-identified, or, um, or or is it not? And recognizing that sometimes when you de-identify data, you lose some of the fidelity of it. Right. Um, so so for the MVP cohort specifically, yeah. you're talking about. Yeah, uh, my understanding, again, I have not worked with it directly, is, is that th there's separate identifiers, right? So you're never actually accessing directly name, that kind of thing. They've already kind of um, abstracted out. I mean, you may, you may have the, 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 the last four of Social Security as part of the MRN, that kind of thing. I know they generated unique IDs for the MVP specifically, which are linked, of course, to um, the, the CDW. Um, so they are identifiable. But um, in terms of the data fields you have access to, um, again, I can't answer from a point of experience, but I, I believe that they're de-identified. Well, just, just because actually it's really hard to, to truly de-identify, right. and, and I'm not necessarily advocating that Correct. people should, because when you start de-identifying data, you start, you know, if you start changing da ages to age ranges, Absolutely. and um, but um, the reality too is the, though that there, you know, especially if, if there's going to be text documents going in there to um, identify every Impossible. last piece of ident yeah, identifiable yeah. information but is difficult. You know what, you, you ask, I mean, it's absolutely a, a conundrum. Um, and 
I know that it's part of the, you know, you, you're having access to all this data, so theoretically it's identifiable. Again, I don't know to what levels they've abstracted uh, things out, but you certainly don't have access to, like, first name, last name kind of stuff. At least not explicitly. Right. Sure. So, so that, that's all included in the basket, the CEW. Again, so this is the point about identifiability. Like, we can track to the patient. So you say, yeah. if you know the MV patient is there, you can actually pull the rel relevant um, information from the clinical data warehouse, and that information may include a radiation oncology treatment summary, for instance, right? In order to get the dosimetric information, oftentimes, as you know, Nima, I mean, here at OHSU, we actually treat veterans, but we treat them at OHSU. So the veterans are sent across the bridge. All of the treatment information, all that plan and stuff is stored within the treatment planning system at OHSU. So even though the VA knows that a given patient was treated, right, they don't actually have access to, at least not explicitly, have access to the treatment planning information, the DVHs, that kind of thing. And so Nima's point is right on. Some of the facilities in the VA actually do have radiation internally. And that data, again, is probably not completely or at least explicitly available because they're often boxed off in treatment planning systems, which are not directly talking to the CDW. So, so it would take some legwork. It would not necessarily take a whole other IRB but it would take a lot of requests, um, and it would have to be through a, a tractable number of patients, I think, or at least a sufficiently staffed um, group that could kind of follow the, the dots. Um, uh, in terms of products, so, so actually I, I do have a product right now. I'm, my fingers crossed. Who knows if it's going to go through or not? We'll see. Uh, but looking at cancer, specifically smoking-induced, well, typically smoking-induced cancers, for instance, lung and bladder in non-smokers, right? So is there some extra genetic underpinning there? And this is in collaboration with the group uh, in Northwestern, and the figures are crossed. Who the heck knows? I don't know what they're looking for. But this is going to be data that continues to evolve, and I think this is going to be ripe for many opportunities moving forward. So, you know, get your, get your brains thinking, and, 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 and certainly we could, ha we could do lots of talking about opportunities. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. I, I don't have a good answer to that at this point. I, 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 in speaking with Scott, and again, thanks, Dave, for that. Um, you know, it, these are one-offs. Um, I don't think there's there's overall class solutions to the problem, and it's obviously a multi-headed problem. So, uh, there isn't such a thing, right? But um, fundamentally, I, 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 I don't know that there really that really has been established. I think they're looking to see how people are using this appropriately, and that's part of the whole point of these pilots. Um, I, and I have not been part of the discussions to date um, thinking about what would be the best structure for that, but I imagine guys like Scott would be. Um, so, you know, you're pointing out an appropriate need, um, uh, and, and I guess it depends on how esoteric the phenotype and how challenging it is. I mean, there are some easier phenotypes than others and some more reliable ones than others. Um, so even if it is implemented, it's not necessarily going to solve the problem for everyone. Right. right. Um, by the way, on, on, on that, the, 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 the project I was referring to is one that was in collaboration with Northwestern. Ours, ours did not go through, but we have fingers crossed for next time. We'll be in touch. They have another round in this fall. Yep. Actually, let, let me ask a follow-up to Dave's question. Um, so, um, you know, in parallel with this is the Precision, of Medis Precision Medicine Initiative, yes. or all of us, I guess right. we're calling it now. Um, there's also, you know, all these PCORI CDRNs, the UK Biobank. Is, is there, um, um, you know, effort uh, across these projects to try to, um, you, you know, I, I obviously I, I assume they're all committed to using the standard ontologies, but, you know, other ways of structuring data, are there uh, those sorts of communications that you're aware of? Yeah, so, so uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not functioning at that level to be able to answer appropriately. 
Um, I know that there is a lot of um, crosstalk um, and thought about that. In fact, to the point that beyond just even um, uh, having um, uh, the ability to kind of structure information, the intelligence is appropriate. Similarly, um, the All of Us cohort is actually merging in some ways with the MVP cohort separately, but actually recruiting through the same mechanism as MVP um, to actually now enroll veterans in All of Us as well. So separate people, potentially maybe one would go to one, one would go to another, or maybe they'll both go to, I, I don't know if there's going to be any double dipping. Um, but I do know that actually the VA is part of that, and I, I, I do think the vision is ultimately to kind of bring those data sets together. But they're very, very different data, right? The, the All of Us cohort does not have the baseline surveys. Like the, the, there's distinct things there and distinct things that veterans have that, that other people don't. Uh, it, 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 it remains to be seen, Bill. And, and I, I have some concerns about All of Us also, right? I mean, like, it's exciting, it's awesome, and all of you guys should consider going out there and joining and putting, putting your genomic and health information out there. But um, it, it, you know, how that's all being structured and how rich is the clinical information that's associated with the genetic information, it, it, it really is a big TBD. All done through the same group. So all the blood gets sent. There's this huge freezer in Massachusetts where they've got like four million tubes of blood, like that kind of thing, right? Like it's it, it very, very standard and centralized. Yep. Um, I had a question about, uh, I guess, kind of how the data are being collected over time. So it sounds like there's the baseline questionnaire that they're doing, um, but is is everything kind of a byproduct of when they're coming in to receive care, or do they have structured research follow-up? Very much the former, meaning okay. that, that this is not meant to be an interventional study specifically. They're just kind of taking whoever came along and whatever health history they have up to that date. I mean, literally, it's not enriched, or at least not intentionally enriched um, for anything specifically. And then as they continue to have follow-ups at the VA, now, one of the things to undermine this, unfortunately, right, there's this thing called the VA choice. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, but the whole idea is that veterans were not getting kind of appointments quick enough, and it's a big political football. But fundamentally, um, one of the solutions from the VA was actually, well, we're going to allow you then to be able to get your care privately, and the VA will pay for it. And so it's kind of decentralizing the, the health records and the health follow-up and everything for patients. So I think that's diluting the quality, or at least the centralized quality of uh, the VA. I think right now it's not too much be on a blip on the radar screen in terms of the cohort data, but that remains to be seen. And, and, and not every patient has all of their care within the VA. So there's no specifically structured follow-ups. However, I mentioned this recontact potential. I think there is the opportunity moving forward now that's not been activated at this point at all, but in the future, there is a very significant opportunity to be able to enroll patients in like a sub-study potentially, or to be able to send out a questionnaire that focuses on something in particular based on some genetically identified kind of flag that you've had, right? So the, I, I, I think this will give a lot more over many years to come. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Well, thank you guys. I really appreciate your time and, and attention. Thank you. Oh.